Greetings. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be a study on serpents, the serpent and serpents in the Bible. I'm going to briefly cover the origin the first time the serpent appeared and I'm probably going to do a more in-depth study on the serpent of Genesis 3.15 now the King James Bible follows seems to follow a type of rule that the first time a word or phrase is mentioned that it gives you an idea of what the word or phrase means within the, the context of the body of the text. And if you look, for example, if you looked up the word serpent in the Bible, in the King James, and did a word search, and looked up all the places where serpent or serpents pops up, it would give you a very, very good idea of what it is talking about. The modern Bibles will not do that. They change the word meanings. So you do not get the idea of what a certain word will mean in one place in the Bible. That's the exact same word in another place in the Bible because the, the words will be changed and you don't make the connection like you would in the King James Bible. I hope that makes sense. The King James Bible will use the same word throughout the Bible. It gives you an idea of the context of that particular word. So, for example, the King James Bible might say serpent in Genesis 3, and then in Revelation it'll tell you that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Well, then you understand, oh, okay, the serpent of Genesis 3.15 is the devil and Satan. The modern Bibles won't do that. It'll say snake or asp or, you know, something like that. And then when you compare it to another spot, the words are not the same. Now, this study on serpents, there's basically two types of serpents in, well, there's more than two types of serpents, but poisonous serpents. Uh, people often say, oh, he got bit by a snake, he was poisoned. That's not entirely accurate. Poison is something you ingest orally. It, something that goes, poison goes into your stomach and kills you. When you get bit by a poisonous, or well, a snake, it's venom. There's a difference. Uh, a lot of people can, you know, some venoms you can drink and it won't kill you because your stomach will digest the proteins. So venom goes into the bloodstream. You're bitten and a lot of venomous snakes, you die. But that's the difference between poison and venom. But there's two types of venomous snakes and, you know, we're not talking about the, uh, the constrictors like the boa constrictor or the... Uh, the Burmese python or, you know, the anacondas, those are, they will crush you to death. But there's the two types of serpents that are venomous have what is called, uh, like, for example, in the United States, you have rattlesnakes. And what they do is their venom digests the tissue. So basically, when you get bit, all the tissue damage comes from the venom digesting. It's, it's a pre-digestion of your body. However, when you start talking about vipers, cobras, and those type, and mambas, those type of 
snakes have what is called a neurotoxin. Uh, neuro as in your nerves. It blocks the transmission from your brain to your nerves going to your heart and your lungs. Your brain tells your heart to beat, but it never gets to the heart because the venom blocks it. So basically, you you become paralyzed and you quit breathing and you, your heart quits beating and that's how it kills you. So, now there's people uh, that claim to be atheists and they'll tell you in Genesis uh, 3, uh, Genesis 3, and they'll laugh, you know, about the, the talking serpent hanging from the apple tree, tempting Eve. So let's take a look at that, because this is the what I call the law of first mention. Usually the first time a word or phrase is used in the Bible, the context will usually, well, maybe not usually, but oftentimes will explain what it's talking about. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, get your King James Bible. And I've beat this horse quite a number of times, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat it again. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, the serpent, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See, God told Adam not to eat of the tree of good and evil, right? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. See, the serpent here is calling God a liar. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, is this a talking snake hanging from an apple tree? I don't think so. All right, so, is this a talking snake? which any atheist knows that snakes cannot talk. Well, go to Revelation chapter 12. And in verse 9, speaking about the war in heaven, And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Cast out of heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Why was he an old serpent? Because he'd been around for a long time. He was around during the Garden of Eden. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I've had people tell me, oh, the devil and Satan is two different beings. Well, Revelation 12, 9 says they're wrong. Uh, Revelation 12, 15. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Revelation 20 and verse 2. Uh, speaking of Michael. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. See, the Bible will explain the Bible and obviously, when in Genesis 3, it's a figure of speech. You know, when you get a bunch of guys down at the beach, and there's a really an attractive-looking woman in a bathing suit, and one of the guys remarks, Wow, look at her. What a fox. You know, obviously, they're not talking about a four-legged creature with a tail that wants to break into the chicken coop and steal chickens, right? I mean, you know, it's called a figure of speech. 
So obviously the serpent of Genesis 3 is not a talking snake. All right, so we're going to probably I'm going to probably do a series on this later, but for right now we're just going to look at serpents in the Bible. All right, so the serpent is tied in with evil. I hope everybody can pretty much look at that from this perspective. All right, let's go back. Now, in Genesis 3:14 it says, "And the Lord said, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou sh uh, shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So, because Satan had tricked Eve, the Lord pronounced a curse. All right, so let's move on, because this is not going to be on... Uh, an in-depth study of Genesis 3, which I think I'm going to do an in-depth study of Genesis 3. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 49. All right, Genesis chapter 49, and starting in verse 16. It says, Dan shall judge his people. You know, it's interesting, a lot of names in the Old Testament have meanings. So the word Dan actually means judge. So it says Dan shall judge his people. Basically, I guess you could translate it and say judge shall judge his people. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Hmm. Now, a lot of people will uh, tell you that Dan was cast off or from from God because Dan's name's not mentioned as one of the tribes in um, in the Book of Revelation. I don't understand why. I don't get it. I wish I did. I would explain it, but I don't. But I don't believe Dan was cast off. Verse seventeen. Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Huh. An adder in the path. An adder is a, an extremely dangerous, venomous snake. There's something called a uh, puff adder, uh, the death adder. They call it the, uh, they actually call it a death adder because when you get bitten by one of them things, you chances are you're going to die. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. So, I don't know exactly understand why Dan is likened unto a serpent but there it is all right so background israel had gone to egypt under under joseph you know if you've never read the old testament you're really losing out on a lot of bible knowledge the Old Testament is called the New Testament Concealed, and the New Testament is called the Old Testament Revealed. So if you don't have a working knowledge of the Old Testament, you are really, yeah, well, you need to read the Bible from cover to cover. A lot of the New Testament will make sense if you understand the Old Testament. But Israel and Joseph went to Egypt. A new pharaoh arises, enslaves Israel, 
And now God is going to allow Israel to leave Egypt. And Moses is going to be the leader. God chose Moses and Moses and Aaron. They were, they were of the tribe of Levi. And if you've ever heard of the book of Leviticus, that book was for the Levites, how to do the worship, how to worship the Lord. The Lord was very particular how he wanted things done. When you come before the Lord, you better come his way. You don't go however way you want. If one of the priests would have entered into the tabernacle or the temple drunk, I believe there was a time in the Bible where somebody came in drunk and the Lord killed him. You didn't, you, you, you want to go to see the Lord, you, go, you better go visit him his way. Okay, you better, yeah. It's like you make an appointment, you know, and uh, you better be dressed appropriately and reverently and respectfully. So here it is, Moses is being called of the Lord and the Lord wants him to go before Pharaoh and tell him, hey, let my people go, the Passover, right? So that's the background. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken, or listen, nor hearken unto my voice, for they, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? <laughs> you know, a good prosecuting attorney will always know the answer for every question that he asks. The Lord's not asking him, oh, what's that in your hand? Uh, I don't know what that is. No, no, no. He's, he's saying, oh yeah, what's in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Why is that? Uh, because it was probably a venomous serpent. It was probably, I'll tell you what, Egypt's got some really nasty snakes. They got cobras. Um, they got some really nasty ones. And uh, the Egyptians worshipped some of these creatures. Uh, you know, Egypt had all kinds of weird religious beliefs. They even had the Egyptian Book of the Dead. No thanks. I got the Bible. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Hmm. Okay. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. You know, when I first came to the Lord, that's who I asked. I said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel because that is the God of the Bible. I don't know who Yeshua Hamashiach is. I, I don't know who that is. But I do know who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. Verse 6. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into the bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it came to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take out of the water of the river and pour it upon dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood 
upon the dry land. You know, I did a Bible study on the plagues of Revelation and the plagues of Egypt. There's a lot of similarities between the two. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. <laughs> Uh, Lord, I'm not a very good speaker. I'm terrible at public speaking. You don't want me. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Uh, guess what, Moses? I made your mouth. And, and you're going to tell me, I'm sending you forth, and you're going to tell me I'm making a mistake, huh? Is that what you're saying, Moses? Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Now, you know what's good? The Bible says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. So it's good to have a second witness. And that verse is in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. Uh, God has an entire set of laws dealing with civil government. Perjury, what they call the judicial system today. It says, One witness shall not rise up against man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. In Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. You know what's interesting? Perjury in the Bible was to be punished by the same thing that they lied about to get the other person in trouble. So if somebody, two people lied about somebody and said, oh, I saw him commit uh, murder and he should be put to death, and you found out that these witnesses were lying, you killed them. Guess what? People fought twice before they committed perjury. I mean, today, now you go to divorce court and... People commit perjury all the time, and nothing happens, you know. And, you know, I'm not picking on women, but women are especially bad about it. Um, they'll make all kinds of accusations. Oh, he was abusive, and, you know, he abused the children, and this and that and the other, and, you know, I should get full custody, and he should pay the child support, and he shouldn't be allowed to see the kids because I'm going to ruin his life or whatever. You know, but in God's law, his civil government, you did not want to commit perjury. So, so, Exodus 4 and verse 15. And thou, Moses, and thou shalt speak unto him, Aaron, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs." 
And Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt to see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Uh, let's see. Verse 20. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. You know, I don't remember the Bible saying much about the sons of Moses. I really don't. I, I You know, if somebody knows where they did anything notable that's mentioned in the Bible, I'd appreciate it but I, I don't uh, if you gave me you know the scripture place where I could read about it I, I don't think Moses's sons did anything notable that's mentioned in the Bible so uh, let's see verse 21 oh, okay well and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and he returned to the land of Egypt and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God did. When you find people that just don't hear hear the gospel or whatever, sometimes God hardens their heart because they love their sin. I'll tell you what. When you want the Lord more than anything other else in this world, you will find him. But these people that love their sin more than anything else in the world or, you know, love of money, the root of all evil. Um, they're not going to find the Lord. Chances are. I mean, you know, I, I won't say that there's no deathbed confessions where people get saved on their deathbed. I, you know, I don't know because look at the thief on the cross. You know, but me, I don't want to cut it that close. So, all right, verse 22. And thou, Moses, and thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Huh. Wow. Remember, this is a prophecy because God hadn't killed the firstborn yet. That doesn't happen until much, much later. All right, let's skip along. Exodus chapter 7. Moses is confronting Pharaoh. You know, the Bible doesn't say many good things about Egypt. And uh, Egypt just <laughs> is not a good thing. Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god, little g, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not hearken unto you. He's not going to listen. 
that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. God is confronting Satan's kingdom. Verse 5, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them, and Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old. He's 80 years old. And Aaron, fourscore and three years old, when they spake unto Pharaoh. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Okay, so when Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, you know, he's going to say, oh, yeah, your God speaking to you will show me a miracle. Isn't that what the, uh, isn't that what the Pharisees always said to Jesus? All right, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. So here it is, you got these, these uh, so-called Jewish leaders wanting Jesus to, well, yeah, you show us a sign from heaven and maybe we'll believe you. Verse 2, he answered, uh, who's answering? Jesus. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is wet and lowering. O ye hypocrites! Oh boy. You know, Jesus used that word a lot when he was talking to the Jewish, the, the Jewish uh, leaders. O ye hypocrites! Ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Uh, that's the Greek rendering of Jonah. And he left them and departed. Uh, what was the sign? Well, that Jesus would be put into the ground. He'd be, he'd be dead for three days and three nights, and then he would be risen from the dead. Jonas was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, right? Well... That was the sign of the prophet Jonas. And, you know, there's people that will try to tell you that, well, you know, Jesus really wasn't dead, that he was just passed out from blood loss on the cross, and then, you know, they sort of buried him, and, and then he got his strength back, and he, you know, he came back. Eh, I don't think so. You know, Roman soldiers were experts in killing and it even says that a Roman centurion put a spear into Jesus' side and out came out water and blood. And let me tell you something. When you're dead, the water will separate from the blood in your body because the heart's not pumping it. It's not mixing. The blood, uh, how do I explain this? The, uh, the platelets in your blood, for those of you that took biology, are heavier than water, I believe. But the water will separate from the red blood corpuscles, the, the, the platelets. They'll separate. And I believe the solids of the blood will sink to the bottom and the water will go on top. So when you got water separated from blood, you're dead. I mean, it means the heart's not wasn't pumping. So... You know, it's just for people to say that Jesus was just passed out and then, you know, three days later, you know, he woke up and walked out of the tomb. I don't think so. Because you know what? The Jews would have killed him again. Oh, 
you were taught by the church that it was the Romans that killed Jesus. Well, how about we believe the Bible? All right, take a look at uh, the King James Bible book of John, chapter 5, 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. Who? The Romans? No. Now therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. What did he do? He committed a horrible crime of healing somebody. Yeah, that was his horrible crime. He didn't commit murder. He didn't rape anybody. You know. Uh, John 7, 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Yeah. And if you want Bible proof from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses starting in verse 14, uh, Paul says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God. Guess what, people? Those antichrists in the Middle East, they don't please God. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Guess what? The Israelis have laws over there that you can go to prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? If you're in the Israeli state and you preach the gospel to a, uh, an IDF, Israeli Death Force soldier, he will probably take the butt of his rifle, smash you in the mouth, and then haul your sorry carcass off the jail. Uh, I wish somebody would preach this to John Hagee's followers. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sin, sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Does that sound like God's chosen people? I don't think so. So, all right. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 7, verse 9. When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his, serpents, uh, his servants, and it became a serpent. Getting ahead of myself there. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the saucers. Now the magicians of Egypt. See, this is what I like about the King James Bible. Somebody goes, oh, what's a saucer? But it tells you in the next sentence. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the saucers, now the magicians of Egypt. Ah, see, saucers and magicians are tied in together. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. Okay. So here it is. Moses does a miracle. And Pharaoh's like, Tuh, that's child's play. I'm going to have, I'm going to show you your little trick here. I'm going to have my people do the same thing. Ha ha ha. And for those of you that don't know it, you know, it says uh, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Do you know what? Uh, you ever heard people chanting? Enchant 
enchantments. That means they're doing spells and incantations. Chanting. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. See, Moses, I, Pharaoh, my people can do the same magic tricks that you do. So you think you're something special? Ha ha ha. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Hmm. You know, the interesting thing about cobras, cobras are snake eaters. They'll eat other snakes. Uh, that's their primary diet is other snakes. Cobras, they're specialized snake eaters. I mean, that's, they love, they're cannibalistic. So I'm not saying the rod, Aaron's rod was, you know, a cobra, but I'm just pointing that out. Boy, I know a lot about snakes, don't I? Yeah, I live in Florida right now, and uh, we have more poisonous, I'm sorry, venomous snakes down here in Florida than uh, any other snake. And plus, we got those stupid Burmese pythons that uh, shouldn't even be here. So we got coral snakes, rattlesnakes, water moccasins. Um, and we got a bunch of them. We got a a bunch of bad snakes down here. All right. So Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Hmm. So, verse 15. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. So, and thou shalt say unto him, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. Well, guess what? That's going to happen in the tribulation, in the book of Revelation. Now think about this. The thing is, when you uh, don't have water to drink, chances are in three days you're going to be dead. By the fourth day, almost certainly you'd be dead. But in Revelation chapter 8, verse 6, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. You know, the Bible talks a lot about blood. You could do, uh, the book of Leviticus says that the life, the life is in the blood. We were not to drink blood. Uh, that's a satanic big thing in Satanism, drinking blood. 
I once saw a documentary on the Dalai Lama where he drank blood from a human skull. I cannot find that on YouTube anywhere. I mean, <laughs> I was like, wow. Can you imagine something that satanic? Drinking blood from a human skull. I mean, please, people. All right, so. Uh, in Revelation 11, talking about the two witnesses. Let's see. Oh, we may as well read from the beginning. Revelation 11, chapter, um, chapter 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall be tread under foot forty and two months. That's the half of, that's three, uh, that's about three and a half years. Uh, that is the last half of the supposed seven-year tribulation period. Verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. A thousand two hundred and three score days is 42 months, people. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. When it says fire proceeds out of their mouth, I'm sorry, their mouth is not a flamethrower, okay? But if they speak the words just like Elijah did, okay? Uh, there were some soldiers. I did an entire, I did an hour and 45 minute study on the prophet Elijah. If you want to go take, do a search on my channel, type in Elijah. Uh, there were some soldiers from wicked King Ahab. He, Ahab was married to Jezebel. Perhaps you've heard of a woman being called Jezebel? Yeah. I've known a few. Uh, I dated a few. Well, maybe not a few, but one or two, maybe. Um, I know Jezebel quite well, actually. But Ahab was a really wicked king. I mean, the Bible even says that, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of anger than all the kings that were before him. I'm paraphrasing. But when the Ahab sent his soldiers, he sent 50 soldiers to go get Elijah and Elijah said, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and devour thee and thy fifty. And boom, they were gone. They were burned up, gone. <laughs> um, you know, so was uh, is Elijah's mouth a flamethrower? No. But, you know, figure of speech, right? If any man will hurt them, the two witnesses, Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood. These witnesses are going to be able to turn the water to blood. You won't be able to drink it. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have... Uh, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. Okay, the two witnesses, their bodies are going to lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt. What did God do to Sodom? Didn't he rain fire down upon Sodom because they were so evil, so wicked? Uh, yeah. Yeah, remember the story about Lot? 
Which is why I tell you, you need to read the Old Testament, people. It's important. It really is. I mean, you know, if you've never read or heard the story about Sodom being fired down from, you know, I, I, what, this wouldn't mean anything to you if you didn't know the story. It means a lot to me. And their dead body shall lie in the street of the great spirit, uh, city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. So here it is, Egypt is likened unto Sodom. So where's this great city? Where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Is he your Lord? Well, he's mine. Where was he crucified? Jerusalem. And people will say, well, you know, the Romans killed Jesus. No, he, they didn't. We just read that in 1 Thessalonians, didn't we? It said the Jews killed Jesus. They killed the, the prophets. They killed Jesus. They killed their prophets. And, you know, they'll say, oh, well, Jesus was crucified by the Romans. So he was, this great city is, is Rome. You know, these people are, they're either, either God has deceived them by hardening their hearts, or they are deceivers. Jesus, my Lord, was crucified in Jerusalem. Okay? So they turn the water to blood.